John Stokes. I'm a partner at um, a Montreal-based seed stage venture capital fund called Real Ventures. Um, we are also the sole funder and management company behind Founder Fuel, which is, I guess, Canada, Canada's um, the. the ex I won't. I won't uh, start winding everyone else up yet, but it's the accelerator which has put more start more. Um, Startups through than any other accelerator in Canada. I'll leave it for that for now. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is Clara Brenner. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tummel, which is an urban ventures accelerator based in San Francisco. So um, we work with very early stage companies that are looking to develop consumer or business facing products or services that solve community problems in cities. So that's companies like HandUp, which is a crowdfunding platform for the homeless, or WorkHands, which is a blue collar LinkedIn type service. Still your mic. Hi, Marcus Daniels, the Managing Director of Extreme Startups in Toronto. Um, we focus on giving digital product founders an unfair advantage. Um, some things that differentiate us is that we uh, focus on co not ideation stage businesses, um, typically companies that have product in market, um, accelerate product market fit. I think uh, we have a great track record for um, speed to seed, specifically institutional money. 83% um, of our graduates have gotten institutional follow-on capital. And we'll talk a bit more about after Dave, because Dave's going to steal the show now. <laughs> uh, my name is Dave McClure, uh, founding partner, I guess, in Troublemaker at 500 Startups. I feel like I'm in an AMA meeting. Hi, my name's Dave. I'm an alcoholic. Um, been addicted I to startups. Keep yeah. coming back. Keep coming back. 12-step program members in the room. Yes. Uh, yes. If you are powerless over your startup. Um, so uh, I guess we run a seed investment program and accelerator programs in three cities, uh, San Francisco, Mountain View, and Mexico. Uh, we generally provide between 30 and 75K uh, net, we take between three and 10% equity. We try and help people get to a round of funding, which might be as small as a quarter million, could be as large as two million. Uh, usually most companies we're trying to work with have functional product and probably have between five to 50K a month in revenue. Uh, some have none. How much equity, how much do you invest? We, ha we do $50,000 for 6% for um, web software based companies and we just introduced a hundred thousand dollars for nine percent for those companies that have a hardware element to them. <laughs> uh, we do 20k uh, in the form of convertible equity uh, in exchange for about five percent. We do up to 50,000 um, plus another thirty thousand dollar grant is non-dilutive and we take between six and ten percent. Uh, U.S. program does net 75K. We invest 100K, take 25K back into the incubator. For that net 75K, we typically take 7% if we're the first and only check. In some cases, we may take 3 to 5% if the company has substantial funding and or revenue. Okay, so for the audience, which is a lot of startups, what's the best way to get into your accelerator? Uh, don't apply. We typically hunt the best. That's what I like to think. Good advice. Okay. Uh, probably get to know other 500 founders or mentors, and uh, if they like what you're doing, usually that makes a big difference in us uh, selecting you for one of our programs. I would say work on a problem that other people aren't necessarily thinking about, something that's probably unsexy that's you know dealing with a community issue, and then definitely come and talk to us beforehand. Uh, put the time and effort in to present yourself in the best light. Um, we, you, you can come and meet us at events like this. Um, you can approach us throughout the year, uh, primarily by hitting us up through vent Real Ventures. And if we think that you don't quite fit where we're looking for, we'll push you across. But also, frankly, if you do apply online and you do go through the normal process, uh, if you put the time and effort into filling out the form, we read every single one. And anyone that we soon straight away realize has put time and effort in, we'll give you the respect to make sure you get a, a, a fair crack. Thank you. Um, so I'll give you guys a chance to at least show off a and, little bit. And be right. good. And be good. Okay. So um, uh, without singling out one or two, sorry, without singling out um, 
what you, Singl you want singling out. Okay, single out. Tell us the best story you guys have of one of your accelerator companies. Because so, it's, it's about showing why we want to join your accelerator. Best story. Uh, I'll, I'll, I guess, start with a company called Hand Up, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they're a crowdfunding platform for the homeless. And when we first started, they were one of the first companies we funded. People used to laugh at us. They were like, haha, that sounds like an SNL skit. Like, who uh, would do that? Um, but frankly, you know, the sharing economy is supposed to benefit people who can't afford to have things themselves or, you know, could benefit from shared resources. And so applying a lot of these tools that we talk about in terms of like dating or sharing a car and applying them to the people in need, uh, I think is really valuable. Um, and they've actually been one of our most successful companies in terms of fundraising and none of their investors are actually social. And that, I think that's an, an interesting part about a lot of our, our companies is that um, social impact investors don't usually step in for seed rounds. Um, and so all of HandUp's funding has, they got, you know, SV Angel, Ron Conway, a, a huge number of, uh, sort of super angels and I think that that's been really great and people think that's really surprising. Cool. Thanks. It's great. Good story. Guys, I, I know you don't want to pick one, but give, me a, give us a story. Give us a good story. A story from an application perspective or anything? anything Mike, 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 Mike. Marcus, put your mic. Um, I, I would say um, we had a whole documentary on cohort two, so I would just do the whole cohort. I don't know, sure, you, you can sure. probably see it's called the Day Job Doc. Um, there were quite, quite a few epic flameouts there and some actually success stories that um, we didn't actually capture on film enough. So um, it's funny how that happens where, um, you know, when, when, when you actually, we, we actually recorded the whole entire cohort experience and I guess the, uh, the documentary captured what they thought was most interesting. And from that, we saw that um, usually the people that are just hunkering down and not really focused on the camera actually get shit done and actually raise capital. <laughs> So, good. Cohort two. Cohort two. All right, Dave. Um, so I guess I would probably tell a story of a company that didn't work out. Um, there was a company that was building a product where we felt like they had a really solid team. They had a strong business lead, strong technical lead. They were building a product for the food uh, ordering and delivery business, uh, which is a category we like a lot. Um, they um, were able to raise about uh, 200,000 total in addition to our capital. Um, about after a year of going after it and not being successful, uh, founder came back to us, uh, said I'd really like to still give it another shot. We put another 25K in to give them a little bit more runway. Uh, and ultimately that did not work out. They shut down. One of the founders went to another company. Uh, the woman who was the CEO of the company, I believe, is working at Google. Um, was not a success story, and it was probably a good relationship uh, for us, and I think I would probably fund her again. Okay, so that must happen a lot. So tell us about why, if I'm in the audience, I want to be part of 500 Startups and your Accelerator. Because we're not assholes when you fail. <laughs> okay. Great, that's great. I mean, it's not, and I think Canada, we don't celebrate failure enough, and so it's, it's, it's great. Okay, cool. Mr. Stokes? <coughs> so, the, I, think, I think the best story is, is probably actually really going to, I'm going to break the story a little early because it's actually happening tomorrow, um, but the best story is a company that joined us, it's a company that when they joined us was called Oomph, no one knew how many O's you had before the oomph. It was three. Uh, but because no one did know, they've now changed their name to Crew. Um, they had a very, very tough time going through the program. They probably pivoted five so times. At, at Mentor Day, the first day that we were there, they're like, yeah, we came here with an idea. No idea. We're stuck. We're like, we're stopped. That's it. We didn't do that idea. We're pivoting. But guys, if you have some ideas for us, like we're listening. So um, it's a. What happened? It's it, you know. So it was very, very, very stressful for them. Um, we have a thing where every so often we do a, a show and tell or something along those lines. And at the end of it, every every company gets a chance to invest a hundred thousand uh, dollars, two lots of fifty thousand. But you can give both of them to one company uh, for everyone else in the cohort. So at the end of the time, everyone knows what everyone else thinks of everyone else. And, and they were pivoting left, right, and center. They always got zero dollars, zero dollars, zero dollars, zero dollars. It was extremely stressful for them. They battled through. 
as a team, they managed to really hang on together. Um, and the two of the co-founders tomorrow are getting married. After going through all of that stress, after going through all of that, and I tell you what, if you can stay together and get married after going through an accelerator like ours, that's a great story. Wow. And, and not only that, but real invested and BDC invested and... Uh, well, I mean, yeah, on the business side, they, they, they raised um, $2 million led by Atlas, Fred Destan, before he went back to, well, just before he went back to, the, to, to Europe. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Hugely successful Angelus campaign uh, from something that two years ago said to us, no idea, we're stuck. We're like, nah, pivoting, I don't know, don't know where to go. So these guys have um, gone through the last couple of years, and it's been a, it's a great story, so. And a happy, hopefully, marriage, so... <laughs> I guess uh, we're less of a like dating friendly accelerator, but um, <laughs> yeah, we actually are. We're anti dating. Uh, I think it's it could be a disaster. Uh, but um, so Tumble is structured in a very specific way to work with a very specific type of company, and it kind of comes out of research that my co-founder Julie and I were doing when we were still in business school. Um, so if you think about companies uh, that have been successful in this space, you'd point to like a Lyft or an Alta Bicycle Share, a Revolution Foods, or maybe even an Airbnb. Um, and some of the challenges that they have, regardless of industry vertical, um, have to do with regulatory issues. Um, and so we um, spend a lot of time specifically working with our companies on dealing with these challenges. So they'll work with the director of public policy at Airbnb or the lobbyist for Zipcar, or um, I individuals like the, the director of sales from Yelp to specifically help the companies think about scaling their businesses from city to city because once you figure out how to operate uh, well in San Francisco, just going across the bridge to Oakland is like starting again. Um, and it can be really challenging for these companies and it makes them a lot less attractive to institutional investors because if it's gonna, you know, if it's gonna take you five years to figure this out and get to you know, scale, no one's gonna wanna work with you. So that's really what makes our accelerator different. Are you ready? Yeah, go for it. So when, st when Steve asked, you know, what is it about your accelerator and why should you go to this one, etc.? I don't know why you didn't start off, you should come to ours because it's run by two business school grads. That's fair. Um, I think that, uh, that's fair. All right, we're smack down here. Right? <laughs> uh, but you know, I think for us it comes out of, yeah, just shoot yourself in the face. Uh, no, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, um, you know, we're working on a really different type of, of entrepreneur and company, and, and it, we've spent a lot of time thinking about it, and regardless of what our background is, I think that, you know, having a real expertise in a particular type of company is really important, and I think a lot of the accelerators that you see that are uh, most exciting and get, uh, getting a, the most attention these days um, have a very specific industry focus, like Rock Health or uh, Code for America. Uh, they're really interesting in terms of their um, very explicit, like, laser-like so focus. Are there too many accelerators now? Like, is it accelerator overload? Dave, you look... Uh, there's too many shitty accelerators, yes. Okay. There's too many shitty business schools, too. <laughs> nice. I'm just uh, getting it. All right, that's fine. I, I would probably agree uh, with Clara that uh, I think specialization and niche focus is probably what's going to be happening over the next uh, few years in the accelerator model. I think it's difficult to be a generalist without really spending a lot of time and scale trying to go after that. I think there's probably a lot more variation that will happen by industry, by customer, by platform, um, by area of expertise, and there's probably a, a lot more variations on those themes that haven't been uh, explored just yet. I think there's some statistic about, like, I think two accelerators are popping up um, every day now, so um, obviously there's a bit too many in the marketplace, and specifically uh, echoing Dave's comments, too many shitty ones, um, but I think the reality is that... Uh, Not enough good ones, though. Yeah. Uh, there'll, be a, there'll be kind of a segmentation where in the next, I think, maybe two, three years, there'll only be probably uh, up to 10 accelerators that really matter globally from a general perspective, and the rest are going to have to be niche, or they're going to be just really early educational type plays. So it'll be really interesting to see how that kind of evolves, or hopefully we can accelerate some death with some of these accelerators. So that'd be um, quite but welcome to like the market. Like, like startups, right? Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of shitty accelerators out there, but... I, Look at me, I'm the only woman on this stage. I think you look at most of the companies that go through all of our accelerators, I think they're predominantly white men in their 20s, and that's really boring. And so accelerators are not doing a good job of uh, cultivating... I'm, I'm a white male, but the majority of the people who work for me are not. And uh, most of our companies, at least a third, probably are female CEO-led. So. And that's fantastic, but you're unusual, and so are we. Like, we're run by two women. Very, yeah. Uh, and I think that, you know, if we're going to see more accelerators out there, like, I'm fine with it. 
uh, as long as they're being more diverse in terms of the type of entrepreneur they're looking so to cultivate. Has, has the market been spread too thin? Like, do we have to st stop accelerating for like a year and let stuff mature so we can get like mature, more mature people into accelerators? Mat repeat entrepreneur? No, I, I don't think so. I think there's much more acceleration in the market happening. Sorry, much more people doing startups in the market. Again, there's lots of shit out there, but there's lots of good stuff going on. Um, I think, you know, the majority of things that I think are probably problematic with accelerators are people who are not writing checks or taking too much equity or not providing relevant expertise. Um, so it's not so much that there are, you know, too many companies getting started, but not enough people with appropriate expertise or subject matter uh, or capital that are helping those folks. I mean, I, I think you've got to look at it from two points of view when you ask that question about accelerators from the people that are running the accelerators and also from the entrepreneurs that want to go to them. I mean, I think everyone would agree there's definitely some shitty uh, accelerators which, uh, which have a negative impact on the progress of a startup and you want to get rid of those. Um, but there are also probably too many, uh, and certainly too many generic ones that they actually have a chance of having any sustainable business model. And if they don't have any sustainable business model, you've got to ask, what's the motivation, what's the driver? Um, we had an accelerator rally um, on uh, Wednesday, and what I said there was accelerator, you know, uh, early stage venture capital is a crapshoot, and um, you've you got to know that. And, and the only way, it's gambling, and the only way to win when you're gambling is by owning the house. Um, you know, Dave, uh, you know, and there may be many things he thinks about this, but I'm certainly, obviously, the scale that Dave operates at. In, his, in itself gives himself somewhat an aspect of a house. The brand means that he somewhat controls the house. Obviously, Y Combinator has a house. Maybe Techstars has a house. I think, I think the idea of going vertical gives you more of a chance. It might be a smaller casino, but you, you still really do have a chance of, of owning the house. I think that's, that's the only way to, to win from a... I might jump in and say that uh, the toughest companies for us to work with are ones that have been through previous accelerators. Uh, we definitely work in the social impact space and a lot of them have gone through social impact accelerators or they went through an accelerator through their college um, and those are the ones that are the most effed up. Like they'll have gone through like a, you know, one sponsored by their school in North Carolina and they were, you know, encouraged to be a North Carolina C-Corp or they worked with the best lawyer in Kansas City but the best lawyer in Kansas City like isn't a startup lawyer and forgot to remind them to file their 83Bs. Like things like that that are really challenging um, and and so yeah, we, we tend to like really early stage entrepreneurs, even first time entrepreneurs over entrepreneurs that have gone through other accelerators. There's not enough innovation actually being driven by most of these programs. We're doing the same like playbook over and over again. So it'll be interesting to see they have more founder led or entrepreneurial leaders that are actually trying to experiment and embracing the failure. That's like how their startups are supposed to be bracing in failure and pivoting um, and rapidly in the cohort. So I mean that's kind of I think to me the the faith I have that this model will actually emerge and 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 serve you know tier one founders um, going forward. I'd open it up to the uh, audience if anybody's got questions. I mean, I got, so go ahead. Um, how, how this works for you? Startup visa program, which as far as I'm concerned was initiated as a me too of what Dave and his clan were we doing. We failed miserably doing startup visa in the US except that we spurred programs in about four or five other countries. Absolutely. Well, we, we I mean, so Canada, Canada did get the startup visa, but as of today, there are zero people that have come in on it. So, it's not having an impact. Um, I think partly that is maybe people haven't worked out how best to use it yet. Um, and I think, I certainly think that, that Extreme and, and Grow have been putting some time in thinking about how to take a better advantage of it, but it hasn't really happened yet. Yeah, there's a huge timing issue with it with respect to, you know, our programs are three months and even though we hunt these entrepreneurs, you know, way in, you know, several months in advance, getting the, the bureaucracy through this. And I'll give you an example, Grow, in their last cohort had two companies they wanted, one from South Africa and one I believe was in, from, from Turkey that yeah, they went into their program specifically and they just couldn't get the paperwork done and there's all kinds of other issues around it. So, um, in, in Grow's first cohort, they had a company from Romania and they came over and they've stayed. So, it's great. Uh, we recruit substantially from international. About a third of our batch is from other countries. We recruit on the ground from almost everywhere. Uh, not so much in Africa, but pretty much everywhere else. And we recruit heavily from Mexico, Brazil, India, China, Southeast Asia, and Middle East. Um, most 
folks are able to find a way, uh, at least for the shorter six-month period or two three-month periods. Uh, it's occasionally challenging to get more permanent residency if they haven't raised a half million to two million dollars. I, I went to your international demo day uh, in New York, and it's amazing. The, the countries that they get to do, and, and in Canada, it's been one or two here and there. We've been um, not as well to do that. So I think um, as the Canadian accelerator industry, we've got to figure out how to do it better. But it's, it was I mean, a cool thing. We're so. feeling pretty confident that you know at least three to five years out more than 50 percent of our companies are going to be outside the u.s and so we have people in about five or six different countries and it's a big area of emphasis we're getting over 52 percent of our applicants outside of canada already right now so i suspect it's going to be the similar type of model a big challenge that we see i'm just going to note is that um for international companies deciding whether or not to raise money in the U.S. is a huge decision, and most of it has to do, especially at an early stage, with whether they think they can convince angels that it's okay to be incorporated, even in Canada. Like, we've worked with companies that said, you know, VCs are fine with it, you know, some of the bigger institutional investors are fine with it, but, like, individual angels are being just, like, a big pain in the ass about being cool with us being incorporated in Germany, you know, which is fine, you know, we don't care and none of the VCs care, so why should the angels care? But I think a real role for accelerators moving forward should be educating the investor community about the value of these international startups and the, you know, the various merits of being incorporated in different countries because it's a real barrier for a lot of companies. I think tendency is to probably incorporate where the majority of your customer activity is going to happen, not necessarily where your funding is going to happen. We've, we found it pretty challenging for companies that are Brazil or India domestic e-commerce to raise money from the U.S. On the other hand, um, global SaaS companies out of almost any place can raise money in the U.S. So it's it's more based on where the customer base is usually. Yeah. Steve, so Clara made a very interesting statement, which is she'd prefer to get sort of a, a pure, non-accelerated, non-incubated startup as as maybe a, a better opportunity to shape their thinking. Right? I was with John at the Accelerator Rally on Wednesday. And Next Big Sound had gone through an absolute train wreck of an accelerator while they were at Northwestern University. And it's amazing they actually stayed together long enough to get to Techstars Boulder to, to kind of get the kind of liftoff. And they've had incredible success. But I'd like to ask Dave and John and Marcus if you share Clara's view. Because you see a lot, of, a lot of young startups constantly think that they have to work stepping stone to the bigger brand accelerator. So they start with... I guess the vernacular today is the shitty accelerators, right? And if they stay together and they get some level of momentum, then they want to get into one of your accelerators. So it's would not, you prefer... not necessarily not correlated with large, well-known programs and yeah. good and small, unknown programs with shitty. Yeah, I hear you. Well, so. but, but you've got a brand. People will aspire to your brand. We, I mean, we've, um, yeah. we've taken... I think we've looked at... at uh, we, I'm not sure if we've taken, but or maybe just about to take yeah. one that has gone through an accelerator before, yeah. um, one that I think has a, a reasonable reputation. Um, and one company went through us, also then went on to do another accelerator. Yeah. And I think uh, in that particular case, they went because they wanted a vertical focus after what yeah. we had given them. Um, I think it just comes down to... I think it comes down to the people and, and if, if, they, if they come in and they talk like they know what they're doing and they make sense, then I, I, don't, I don't mind, um, you know, maybe, no, that's right, I'm not going to give you another hard time. You're just, it was, you're just, it was, it was just, it's just too easy. I mean, you don't, you don't want to take them in because they've been through a, another accelerator because you won't be able to have any impact on them. Well, accelerator money is also... Ex yeah, accelerator money is extremely expensive as well. So if you go through a top tier program in any, wherever country you are, going into another program, there has to be a really good reason. I think Dave made an example of incorporating your company where your customers are. So we have an example from our cohort for Famebit. Um, they were they did a really good job in our program. Um, they get no investor meetings here in Canada. So they knew that their market was in the US, specifically in LA. Um, they got the option to get into Dave's program. They went there and they just raised 1.4-ish million. So within three, six months graduating from our program. So, you know, there's there's strategic reasons sometimes, and, and that's one of the reasons why we've actually started our program now in New York. So we've kind of bridged between Toronto and New York. Um, and that's kind of our geographical focus. Um, and that's where we add the most value. Yeah. Um, I think we probably would see more benefit than not from companies going through other accelerators. And we've worked pretty extensively with a lot of different programs around the world. Uh, we've worked with both Extreme and Real to bring their companies in. I have, we haven't worked with Tamil that I'm familiar with yet. Uh, we've 
worked with companies like uh, Morpheus Labs in India, with Startmate in Australia. Um, I, I've been asked uh, humblingly by some of founders who I really wanted to go through our program to help recommend them to YC, and I've done that, which is really kind of like <laughs> conflicted <laughs> opinion. Uh, we had a company that we accepted into our program, then get accepted into YC, and then go to YC, which you know was also humbling. Um, I know how that feels when people accept it into ours and then decide to go to 500 startups. Yep. Yep. So we all or extreme like startups. <laughs> I think you never have happens, right, John? You have to <laughs> sort of on, figure out where you are in the ecosystem and try and do the best job you can in a way that's differentiated. But I think you also should be looking out for the entrepreneur's best interests. And yeah. I'm I'm not going to you know say that a company that gets accepted into YC shouldn't consider YC as a program. Uh, I do think we have some things to offer that are differentiated from them, but certainly from a financing and brand perspective, they've been around a lot longer than we have. Um, but um, I, I generally think that most people who have gone through, let's say, you know, two or three cohorts or at least a couple years and haven't fallen by the wayside probably have something to offer. Um, and we've been willing to sort of work on a hybrid set of terms with some other uh, accelerators, uh, SeedCamp in particular, we did that with. Uh, to lessen the impact on the entrepreneur. Um, but we're, we're also competing with companies not going through any accelerator program at all, and sometimes people have their shit together and don't need to do those programs. So we are a little unique in that we do both seed and accelerator, and we invest in other accelerators, companies, even at Demo Day when we're coming competing. So try and be flexible about To be clear, like it, there are lots of great accelerators, and we, you know, we tell companies that apply to Tumble, um, you could be in another accelerator while in Tumble. You have to physically be working out of our offices, but you know, if someone else is going to give you money and you think they can give you good advice, like, yeah. go for it. That's fine by us. But oftentimes we've found that um, really early stage companies, if they've gone through an accelerator and then come to us, have often yeah. times been given less than good advice. Yes. So p part of what you guys all offer is some great mentors. So how do you get those mentors to really help so maybe like a good mentor story about how the, they've helped the company. And then second is, how do you, on an ongoing basis, help the company with those mentors? Um, so I think when we got started, we recruited a lot of folks that I had worked with at PayPal and my partner, Christina, worked with at Google. And we expanded that to a lot of other platform companies and then eventually other founders in our portfolio. Um, we made an intentional decision to focus on mentors who are not investors and more focus on, uh, there, there are some who are investors, but most of them are engineering design or marketing folks that had operational experience, probably 80, 20, I would say, in terms of that profile versus an investor profile, um, which might have some impact on their ability to raise capital, but probably helps them get you know, product market fit a little bit better. Um, we try and think about how to engage the mentor community as much as the founder community. So it's not always, you know, pushing the mentors to commit to certain time frames. Yes, we do that, but we're also trying to, you know, provide a fun and interesting experience for the mentors to want to participate. So it's uh, it's on us to kind of present a compelling story for them and great companies to work with as much as, you know, similar for the mentors and uh, founders. I mean, I think. Uh I would, I would absolutely echo what Dave said in terms of it's mu it is as much about the mentors, about the founders. I mean, without the mentors, there's no connections, there's no relationships, there's no knowledge. Um, and again, you know, I was saying the other day, we actually, uh, should we say at a, at a, a program management level, sort of have a mantra that we are trying to ensure that the program is run for the mentors and it's up to the companies to benefit from it rather than the other way around. Um, and it's something which means that you constantly need to replenish and every time we have an event or an activity it's not a, only a question of how can we create a situation in which knowledge can be transferred from a mentor to a team but how can knowledge experiences relationships be transferred between the mentors that are getting involved yeah we've experienced with that um, we experimented with different types of mentor models from having lead mentors to having a product mentor and a business focused mentor to and what we've learned recently is kind of segmenting out mentors versus experts um, and trying to get people the mentors themselves more involved and in having their incentives more aligned with the relationships with 
with, an, with, the, with the cohort company who's driving the mentor they want to work with. And even when looking at our mentor pool, you know, and, and obviously the refresh that tends to happen, you know, I get pitched all the time of, you know, mentors, people want to be mentors at extreme startups, yet, you know, there's no demand from the actual startups to meet with them. So it, it, there's the other side of the coin there. And I think, you know, as these models change, I think, you know, at the Accelerator Rally on Tuesday, um, we talked a bit about that. And I think what um, I think Founder Fuel is doing is actually quite good in being, having that sort of mantra of being focused towards the mentors and that sort of thing. It yields strong benefits. Um, Building on that last comment, I, I definitely think we found when we first started that we brought in all these technical experts and you know people to provide very specific advice on like how to create the perfect deck, and our entrepreneurs really like didn't care at all. They were most uh, excited about meeting with other entrepreneurs who'd been successful in the space, so they'd much rather talk to the CEO of Revolution Foods about their deck or the chief technology officer of Lyft about their you know strategy for scaling up to multiple communities. And so we've definitely changed over time our, our focus in terms of our mentors and a lot heavier emphasis on, on entrepreneurs who can provide a lot of real world examples. Um, and then in terms of like the technical advice and sort of basic business support, we've started a new thing, this current cohort that's happening right now, which I really am excited about. And I think a lot of our companies are as well, which is we have program managers in house who serve as sort of uh, special assistance to our cohort and they're available to do discrete research tasks to help them with their deck um, and kind of serve as sort of like an additional resource but they're there the whole time the whole cohort as opposed to like bringing someone in for the day so tiger his name is tiger it's the best name um is our program manager who's there for our companies and you guys pay him yeah actually well actually no because we are a 501c3 nonprofit. somebody pays him but not me it's actually okay. bain and company thank you bain nice that's great. That's great. It's a, the, the new vehicle. Uh, a few more questions. I've got no idea what my time is supposed to be, so I don't know. Start up. Five minutes? Ten minutes? Ten? Okay, cool. Questions? I'm going to bring the mic over. Since to some degree, um, you know, as you said, accelerators are startups, what are ways that you as, you know, whether it's founders or managing directors of different Accelerators have pivoted your models as, you know, founders of these accelerator programs. What pivots have you taken? Why? What has changed in your model? Um, we've run about nine cohorts. Uh, we're working on our 10th cohort. If I count Mexico, about three or four more. And I ran the Facebook Fund Accelerator Program in 2009. Um, most of it's been kind of uh, dialing up or down uh, capital and equity taken. Uh, we've emphasized uh, in the beginning a lot of design and UX principles. We've started to lean more towards distribution and online marketing more. Uh, we've played around with programs where we've had mentors invest at you know prices that we come in on at slightly prices higher. We've had them basically not invest at all. Um, so we've tweaked the program almost every three to six months that we're working with. Uh, most notably and somewhat unpopular, we charge a program tuition fee that used to be 15K of the 50K that we invest. So the fund invests 50K and uh, we took 15K into the accelerator. Um, we now do 100K and then take 25K. Uh, most people think that's avaricious. Uh, on secret, it was claimed that I was basically fucking with people and not being truthful. Um, the reality of the situation is, is that we can't charge those services revenues to the fund without uh, impacting the tax status of our LPs. We have to charge that separately. So I, I haven't figured out a way to do it any more transparently than we do. And we disclose that like I'm do doing now in our FEQs, in videos, on stage, almost every fucking possible way. We charge $25,000 to every team and startup that attends our fucking program. Please tell other people so they don't accuse me of lying or not disclosing this. Am I extremely fucking clear about that? Yeah. As a result of that, as a result of that, we have about $3 million in capital to provide resources, labor, food, drinks and beer, demo days to all of our companies, which we think is helpful in teaching them and getting them money and customers. And we probably invest the most amount of dollars per person, per accelerator on the fucking planet, as far as I'm concerned. And if you don't like it, you don't have to come here just like an abortion. Don't have one. <laughs> Um, and so no, I, I, I heard him pitching um, an entrepreneur today, and he was very, very clear about that. But one thing, one thing and, and I may not have read this, but I, I'm sure I read it somewhere, which I do think is a bit of a misnomer, if I read it. And if I'm wrong, I'll just shut that up. 
Um, when you talk about the fund as opposed to the accelerator, I do think I've sort of read you say that you either run it for no management fee or 1% management fee or something like a crazily low management fee, uh, which... Management fee for the current fund is 1.5% average, starts at 3%, decrements to 1% over a 10-year okay. so period. So is, it is a low management fee, but That's I think I've seen recent. you... recent. The okay, original ones were different. Yeah, because I think I've seen you sort of actually say you know fucking vcs they take too much of a thing and we take less but and and if you did say that i'm really good at marketing the 20 and ripping on okay other so VCs. so so you're not fucking with the entrepreneurs now you're just fucking with your lps my lps know exactly what i'm pitching they bitch at me just as much as the entrepreneurs do we also iterate on our fund lpa structure as well i know <laughs> mid mid negotiation no it's all right don't worry we are investors in uh, 500 startups. We love what Dave does. Look, we're, we are still learning and still figuring this shit out. I've been a professional VC maybe five years of my life. Never. Uh, probably never, yes. So <laughs> I'm just an entrepreneur in the financial services area. I'm trying to make it work. Um, but Wh what are some underserved or poorly served niches that accelerators, new, acceler new accelerators should focus on? Did you, did you hear all that? Poorly or underserved niches, niches for accelerators to focus on, or new accelerators to go to. Oi! Ow! Ow! Sorry about that. Um, sorry, 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 sorry. I'll ask the question a different way. If I was going to start an accelerator, what area would I go into? <laughs> right? Is that the question? See? See? Uh, okay. I would say something that you really care about, which I know is like a really sappy answer, but it's true. Uh, you're. There are so many accelerators out there that unless you have a really passionate, unique vision, you're not going to sell it. I mean, we're structured as a 501c3 nonprofit, and we're an angel fund at the same time. Like, convincing uh, the IRS, convincing nonprofit funders that this was something that was worthwhile took a lot of work. It did not just happen overnight. And so we're, but it's because we're really passionate about it. We do think that there's a huge community impact that we can make. Um, but basically, like, look around for other nonprofit accelerators that invest in for-profit companies or hybrid organizations, uh, social impact companies. There aren't very many. Um, and so it's going to take a lot of persistence. So I think it's, it's about defining a specific industry vertical and then being patient and tolerant enough to be able to like see it through. I mean, I'd also maybe say something which there's a unique reason why it should be a vertical. Um, I don't think you, I don't think it shouldn't be a marketing reason. It should be generic. There really is a reason. I mean, we funded um, we funded one in the gaming space because, frankly, the gaming space is just it's so it is so different. It requires it has a whole bunch of different economics, different drivers. Yeah, you can stick gaming companies into traditional accelerators, but there is a hell of a lot of different ones. So that's sort of why we looked at it. Um, and the white space. I think uh, drone-based social gaming, Internet of Things companies based on SaaS platforms are really hot right now. The, the white spaces. Definitely any, focus other, any, on other, that. any other white spaces? Focus on the impact. Back to echo the comment before about just, you know, you have to be passionate about it and think what, what value proposition are you actually bringing to the entrepreneur? You know, don't create an accelerator just for creating an accelerator. I mean, most, most tier one founders think they don't need an accelerator, and that's a good thing. So if you're not solving an actual problem like most entrepreneurs that you're supposed to be funding, you probably shouldn't be creating an accelerator. Anybody else? Okay, Daniel. And I, I try not to yell. So we heard a couple of times about the need potentially for uh, s more specialized acceleration programs. And I kind of sit on the opposite side of the coin. So I, I'm in a company that has a very specific focus, animal health, and we want to penetrate into the startup world. We want to work with these companies. And we found out that through our research, we would be a terrible accelerator program. But we do have sector specific expertise and we want to partner with groups like you to help make some of those ventures more successful. So how can companies in this space that have something to offer partner with your organizations? Why not just work with the companies directly? Experience, frankly, we haven't worked with a lot of startups, right? We know what the needs are, we know what to look for, but you don't want to discredit all the experience and resources that your groups bring to the table. Well, I think, you know, it all, it all starts with not wanting anything and wanting to give, and that, you know, most of the people that want to give in our place are, are coming as mentors. So, you know, if, if there are no, 
veterinary healthcare startups in a cohort, you're not going to help. But I mean, everyone knows what's going on in a particular cohort, um, or everyone knows what sort of or if you're coming across companies, there's no reason, and you think they're pretty damn special, there's no reason why you couldn't recommend them to to one of our programs. It doesn't seem something as crazy as that. Um, so I think, you know, in a way, I, I'm happy that someone like you is who does have some speciality is saying, look, how can I get involved? I think, um, you know, it's a it's sort of a different approach. And sort of coming back a little bit to your your question, which we didn't really answer, and that's why you've drifted off. You're coming back to your question, which 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 we didn't, which I know we didn't really answer, in in terms of in terms of what's what's uh, what's changing and what's the evolution and all the pivoting. You know, um, the fact that Dave, who is probably one of the most out there pushing it guys, came up with such boring crap as to what he's been iterating on, which frankly is the same boring crap that we've been iterating on, is we have to do, s there needs to be some more magic injected back into accelerators. You know, coming up with, you know, so I think if you think about that, you know, that, that you can think of a way that you can inject magic, because even, you know, I'm sure even Dave is looking for some more magic thrown into his. I mean, you might still be in the excitement first cohort bubble, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it needs innovation, it needs magic. Okay, quick last question, and then we'll, uh, the closing thoughts. So staying on the lines of uh, markets, are you aware of any food tech and or including restaurant solutions uh, accelerator programs? Uh, we're not, but I think... Uh, <laughs> the open table no, 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 restaurant no, actually, accelerator. Oh, fuck you guys. I think that's actually an interesting question. We've go. invested in about 30 <laughs> companies in food tech. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's very specific, but probably you know, the food industry, food and beverage industry is multi-tens of billions of dollars, and everybody eats and drinks uh, last time I checked. So like, it's a pretty big fucking market, and there's a lot of specific... You know, use cases and marketing best practices for that industry. So that might sound crazy, but I actually think that's a good one to work on. There are a lot of accelerators out there that focus on food or on agriculture. I think pretty much every city has one. There's a lot of rural areas do what? it well. Really? Yeah, there are a ton in, in like? Palo Alto. I'm trying to remember the name of uh, Food Lab, and then there's a couple other ones that, that just popped okay. up, like literally just started. Um, but frankly, I'm like I think there are a lot of opportunities. We've worked with a number of sort of urban agriculture specific. Uh, startups, uh, but if I see another, sorry, food delivery service, I'm going to kill myself. Uh, there are... Yeah, there's way too many restaurants. Too many. That's like, so over. No, not restaurants, but the fact that, like, they're, they're, like, everyone needs to eat. Obviously, there's room for innovation, yeah, but, like... Yeah, it's a big fucking market. People think it's unsexy. 500 uh, no, recipes. Think everyone thinks it is sexy. That's why everyone's starting those in, companies. In the last boring. year, there's probably too many food delivery startups yeah, getting there funded. Are. There are. But not in, like, India, Brazil. Why did he wake up with a minute to go? I know, right? No, I just think that, like, there's so many ways in which you can be creative in the food space, and frankly, everyone is following on because they've seen certain success in cer certain areas like food delivery. And, like, if a, if a food accelerator is going to do something good, I think it would be to diversify the types of food-related startups that are out there. All right, last sort of thoughts on where does this world go? Where does the accelerator world go? If you had, like, a crystal ball... What's the latest and greatest new white space or different thing or a closing thought or something stupid, whatever. Or best story. Okay. Or whatever. Any ideas, thoughts? Well, I think there's a global battle for tier one founders, and that's the it's biggest a global challenge. battle for tier one founders. Yeah, somebody so specifically tweet that. in Canada. <laughs> yeah, tweet it, do it, retweet it, please, um, at Extreme Startups as well. Um, so th the reality is that, you know, we're shifting our gears that we get over 500 applications per cohort, um, and we have th there's a real timing issue. So the first part of our evolution was moving away from just a singular entry point on, you know, we meet amazing founders, but they still need some basic mentorship and some expert advice. So we get them in our office, um, get them to working out of our space, and then they actually compete to get into a future cohort. So we're spending more time building a relationship with them. And we're seeing um, a lot of the challenges that we have right now is that there's this global connectivity a aspect that's lacking from um, a lot of these tier one founders and they're going to our top Canadian founders are going to go to programs in the US that are that are t that are giving them better connectivity so we're taking our companies on the road hence our first proposition was building better connectivity in the US but the idea is how do we actually um, bridge the country to build not just a program but more of a platform that helps us succeed together 
Great. I'll come up with the opposing view, which is I don't I don't know what this deal is about this like com competition for top tier founders. There aren't enough founders, um, frankly, and I think some of our the best entrepreneurs and companies that we've seen come out of Tumul are from first time entrepreneurs who've maybe dealt with a problem firsthand, like getting into get the, getting their kids into preschool and then starting a company. They have a lot of passion about the area, and I think frankly we need to have more first time entrepreneurs out there who have a lot of it industry expertise um, and personal expertise with a specific problem. Um, I wouldn't worry about competing for founders if they don't want to be part of your accelerator. Like, who cares? Well, there's um, a difference between venture-backable founders versus people building lifestyle businesses. I, I disagree. I think a lot of these companies are venture-backed and all of the entrepreneurs that we've had that, you know, maybe first-time entrepreneurs or not traditional entrepreneurs per se have been very successful raising money and uh, I just think that we have an expectation of what a founder should look like and what we should be competing for and that's really boring. Yeah, but it's comparing San Francisco and the Valley versus the rest of the world, so. No, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I think most of the entrepreneurs that I'm talking about are not necessarily from San Francisco, but are thinking about really interesting problems, and it's, uh, it's an, I think it's on all of us to sort of encourage those individuals in your community to start companies as opposed to competing over this small segment of entrepreneurs that we've identified in college as like high potential. And, but that's why the Founder Institute and those sort of ideation programs exist. So if you're thinking of where you actually want to play, if you're actually running an accelerator model that's going to, you know, finish, be able to track companies that build billion dollar businesses in your ecosystem, specifically in ecosystems outside of the valley. Could you define lifestyle business? Um, a lifestyle business could be any sort of business making tens of millions of dollars. That's totally fine. It's not something. I think a lifestyle business is a $10 million a year revenue business. I used to work for one. Okay, I'd fund a business that I think could be a $10 million a year revenue business. Me but, too. It, but, but a lot of founders I don't want to. Venture capitalists fund billion dollar companies because they're so fucking inefficient that they can only make money when there's billion dollar outcomes. And if they were better investors and more efficient investors, they could actually make money on $10 million revenue exits. What's the opposite of shooting water at you? <laughs> I want to just like hug you. <laughs> I would, I would have to agree with Clara on this one, that I think that there is a, a ridiculously large market of entrepreneurs out there and investors, particularly venture capitalists, particularly Silicon Valley venture capitalists, do a fucking terrible job of discovering anything that's more than 30 miles outside their backyard or 30 yards outside their backyard. Uh, maybe New York, but they certainly don't go to very many other places in the U.S. They very rarely go outside the country, and most of the people in the world live outside the Silicon Valley. Uh, and it's terribly narrow-minded and just like ridiculously great for me because I'm funding all of them. Um, I think that uh, our competition, as much as I would like to rip on VCs, is not with VCs. Uh, it is with other accelerator programs a little bit, but it's probably much more with business schools and more traditional forms of education where people encourage would-be entrepreneurs to pay fifty dollars to $100,000 a year to read about successful businesses rather than try and make them themselves I mean, uh, their own business. I, I think, I mean, I understand a little what Marcus is saying, and I think, you know, like, <coughs> people will come and say to me, hey, do you need more seed capital in, in Canada? And I'm sitting there like, I've got, uh, I've got all this yes. money. Yes, the answer is yes. I, and I'm sitting there like, I mean, I've got all the money, and, you know, I'm, I, I don't know that I need any more right now. You don't right want any more competition, John. Come on, there's like five no, real right. seed VCs in, oh, in Canada? It, absolutely. I agree. And in fact... I hope that I will start 10 more in the next 24 months. So I don't, I don't like competing so with YSC and chasing their tail, but it makes me a better investor, makes yeah. me better, run a better accelerator. Well, I, I definitely think that, but I think the one of the things that, that, that you have done, and this is the, this is the point that, that I think is important, is that you have created a, a, a magnet, a magnet which sucks a shitload of people, and you, have, <laughs> and you, have, you also have... Because I, I come to Canada. <laughs> no, that's right. But, 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 but in addition to that, and everything I'm about to say is positive, by the way. I'll try and find something negative at the end. But, <laughs> but in addition to being able to suck everyone, you've also got a, an amazing filter network, which reduces a lot of the crap. Uh, and I think that one of the things that, you know, that probably Extreme needs to do, and, and we certainly do, is, is find better systems for getting rid of the crap. And by crap, I don't mean people that don't, don't deserve to be listened to, but just people that that shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be anywhere near it. So I think I think you've done a really good job of that. And I think when you are in the valley, um, I think the ratio of crap to pretty good is different. I mean, this is one of the reasons I think why Marcus is saying that he's driving his accelerator. Don't apply to it; he'll find you, because he just has to do with so much crap. I think we've actually developed 
a system to be able to take as much in as possible, filter it, and find really good companies. And I think hopefully that'll be our success. Thank you, everybody. Um, this was a great panel. Thank you for coming up to Montreal. <laughs> Enjoy the last of the Startup Festival. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, awesome, guys. Appreciate it.